thank you all. Um, I'm going to talk to you about, um, let's see, there we go, the attention schema theory, or AST. It's a theory of consciousness. In philosophy and science, consciousness has come to mean a uh, subjective experience of anything, any specific event, whether external, like a sensory event, uh, or internal, like a thought or an emotion. And clearly, not all events uh, processed by the brain have conscious experience associated with them. And an active field of study is trying to understand the, the mechanism and the adaptive value, if any, of conscious experience. The attention schema theory is a mechanistic, demagicked, demystified theory of many things. One part of the theory explains why people believe they have a consciousness magic inside of them. Another part of the theory explains why that particular self-model has some really important cognitive functions. And the theory is buildable. I think the study of consciousness is more and more a matter of technology. Traditionally, it was all about philosophy, the philosophy of mind. Then it became part of psychology and neuroscience. But I think the study of consciousness has now moved into a different phase. It's becoming a part of artificial intelligence. People want to build human-like machines. They want to build AI that can interface effectively with people. But if you're an engineer, consciousness is a fraught topic. You don't want to waste your time chasing magic. If somebody says, uh, just make it complicated enough. Just make it integrated enough. Just give it enough feedback loops. Just give it a, um, a global workspace and poof, a magic feeling will come out of it. Um, that turns out not to be super helpful to the engineer. And I think most existing theories of consciousness are essentially magical. There's always a point at which they say, and then the magic experience happens. It's like alchemy. You put in frog tongue and newt eye, and then poof, magically consciousness is supposed to come out. That's been called the explanatory gap. But there is a way to avoid the gap. Let me put it uh, this way. Everything you think about yourself, everything you think you know, no matter how sure you are that it's true, derives from information in your brain. Or you wouldn't be able to think it or believe it or say it. When we insist we have a subjective experience of something, we do so because there is some bundle of information constructed in the brain that is telling us that we have subjective experience. It's a self-model. And the brain's models are never accurate or complete. They can be pretty good, but they're never fully accurate. Human brains think they have a magical, non-physical essence of experience inside of them. They think that for one and only one reason, bundles of information in the brain. If we understand those bundles of information, then we may understand the whole thing. The attention schema theory is a proposed account of the relevant bundle of information in the brain, the self-model that makes us all so certain that we have a subjective experience. It's a theory of why that particular model is of adaptive use. I think that's why the attention schema theory has become well-liked by computer scientists. 
and artificial intelligence experts. Uh, it's become popular in that domain. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard uh, machine learning experts tell me, hey, finally, there's a theory we can actually build. It's going to take study and development, but ultimately it's buildable and it points to specific practical benefits. So for this talk, I'm going to explain the conceptual framework to you, at least the main uh, parts of it. My goal is not to give you lots of scientific detail. I've tried that in other talks, and it just causes confusion. You can look up my data papers online, or you can ask me afterward. We have a ton of psychology and neuroscience data. I think it's more important to get across the overarching ideas. If I can do that today, I'll be happy. The theory is, at its heart, simple. It says that the brain constructs an attention schema. What's that? I'll start with an analogy, a very close analogy. Another schema constructed by the brain, the body schema, the Essential insight, uh, insults, insults, the essential insights will transfer directly to the attention schema. Your physical body is represented in the brain by a bundle of information. The body schema represents the shape of the body. It keeps track of posture and movement, and it makes predictions. It's probably constructed in a network of cortical areas including the parietal lobe and the motor and premotor cortex. It's necessary for the good control of movement. You need to monitor and predict what your body is doing to effectively control the body. That's a, a general principle of control engineering. Any control system needs a model of the thing it controls. The same brain networks are also involved in looking at someone else and interpreting the other person's stance and movements, modeling someone else's body. In that sense, a body schema plays um, a significant role in social interaction. It's an often overlooked but very important part of social cognition. And there's a third major consequence of having a body schema because higher cognition and language have some access to it. The body schema gives us an approximate reportable understanding about our own bodies. When you close your eyes, you can no longer see your arm, but you still know how it's positioned, how it can move, you have an intuitive understanding of your own arm. It's never truly an accurate understanding. It's always a little approximate, sometimes more than a little. Uh, like if you have an amputation, uh, your arm is removed, there's no arm at all. <clears throat> you may still have a phantom arm, which is the body schema continuing to represent the missing arm and the information reaches higher cognition and verbal report. About 12 years ago, in the middle of studying the body schema, uh, I was thinking about attention, in particular selective attention, the way the brain focuses on and deeply processes a small number of items at a time. And classically, people study visual attention, but uh, you can also selectively attend to a sound, to a touch, to a sentence, or even to a thought or a memory. Attention is a lot like an arm. It moves around from one set of items to another in a, a complex way, and the brain controls it strategically. So I proposed at that time, I proposed that in order to monitor and predict attention, the brain must construct an attention schema. 
And the more I studied this attention schema, the more I realized it plays a central role in human cognition. What exactly is an attention schema? It's a bundle of information that describes attention. If you could stick wires in the brain and extract information, <clears throat> information from someone's attention schema, it would tell you about the, uh, the complex state that a person's attention is in. It would tell you, in effect, uh, this item is a glow with attention. That item has less attentional glow. And all these items at the edge have only a dim attentional glow. And predictively, it would also tell you what state is likely to come next. Attention is going to fade over here because that item is not very interesting and it's likely to shift over here the next moment. And finally, it would tell you about the predicted effects of attention on thought and behavior. It would tell you things like, aha, because the text in this book is intensely aglow with my attention, I'm likely to understand it and remember it tomorrow. And because that game of catch over there is only dimly in my attention, I am not going to be able to dodge the ball very well if it flies my direction. So that's an attention schema. It's a descriptive and predictive model of attention. I'll tell you about three specific consequences of having an attention schema, which parallel the case for the body schema. First, having an attention schema should be useful for controlling your own attention. Suppose you're, you're reading a book and an annoying bee is distracting you. You want to sustain attention on the book and reduce it on the bee, uh, but you still want a little attention on the bee in case it comes too close. This task is much easier if you have a system that constantly monitors your attention to make sure it stays within the desired range on each object. And also that predicts when your attention is about to slip. It's called control engineering. You need a model of the thing you're controlling. Second, building a model of someone else's attention should be useful for social cognition. It's, it's a part of theory of mind or intuitively knowing what other people are feeling and thinking. <clears throat> if you know what someone else is paying attention to and you know the rules of how attention moves and how it impacts behavior, then you gain a, a huge predictive advantage. You intuitively know what's in the focus of the other person's attentive mind. And therefore, you know what's going to drive that person's behavior. And third, an attention schema should provide your higher cognition with an approximate reportable understanding of your own attention. And what I mean by an approximate understanding is the attention schema might be the source of our beliefs and intuitions about consciousness. Let me expand on that. The brain's models are never accurate. They're always approximate. And in this account, your brain constructs a schematic model of attention. The model leaves out all the mechanistic details uh, of how attention is really a, a competition between neural signals occurring physically in this and, and that network in the brain. Uh, the brain doesn't need to know that kind of detailed information. According to this model, this attention schema, the imperfect detailed poor description of attention, according to the attention schema, you possess an internal essence, um, a glow 
divorced from any physical mechanism. It just floats inside you. The essence vividly, mentally takes possession of things, different things at different times, and it confers on you the ability to understand and react to those things. That is a schematic model of attention. And it's how people describe consciousness. People believe they have conscious experience. We're certain of it. We claim to have it. Unless you don't believe in basic logic, then you have to accept that the belief, the certainty, is based on information in the brain. And the hypothesis presented here is that the relevant bundle of information computed automatically in a, in a deep layer is the brain's schematic model of attention. <clears throat> the theory therefore pulls together three processes. First, the incredibly useful ability to control your own attention, uh, without which you can't really function in the world. Second, the incredibly useful ability to model other people's attention and make predictions about their behavior. And third, the least important outcome. The theory explains why we're so certain that we have a kind of magic essence of conscious experience in us. From the technology point of view, AST may help us build artificial intelligence that is more capable at strategically controlling its own attention and more capable at social interaction. And <clears throat> as a, a, a fun side effect, AST may lead machines to think they have consciousness, machines that self-describe as having conscious experience. Uh, I would argue in the same way that the giant human neural network up here thinks that it has a conscious experience. The theory is very simple, very simple, very logical, but uh, nobody ever understands it the first 10 times they hear it. So here's a different way to explain the same theory. <clears throat> Suppose you're looking at an apple. You're paying at least some attention to it. Your visual system constructs a model of it. The model is a bundle of visual information about the apple. Uh, including its color, its shape, its location, and so on. Attention on the apple means that the visual model is boosted, its signal strength is boosted, allowing it to reach higher cognition and um, explicit verbal report. So now there's an information throughput that allows you to say, oh, there's an apple, it's green, it's round. And this sounds like the uh, global workspace theory of consciousness. Attention boosts the apple's representation. That representation enters the global workspace, uh, meaning that it can influence other systems around the brain. Therefore, higher cognition and ultimately language can gain access to it. That's the global workspace theory. <clears throat> but I think there's something missing from this account of consciousness. If I may say so, I think what's missing is the consciousness part. <laughs> um, this is what I would call a magical theory, inadvertently magical theory, because it's, it's very reasonable. I like the theory very much, and I think it has validity until you get to the part where a conscious experience emerges with no explanation. So consider this, to put it differently, consider this, suppose you're looking at the apple and I ask you, what's going on right now? 
You can describe the visual features in front of you. The apple is green, it's round. That's you as a machine with uh, this, kind, <clears throat> this kind of information throughput. But you can also make a second kind of claim. You can say that you have a subjective experience of the apple. What's the information source for that claim about subjective experience? Every claim has an information source. So let's not appeal to magic here. It doesn't just magically emerge. Every claim has an information source. And this is where the attention schema comes in. In addition to constructing a visual model of the apple, what if the brain also constructs a model of attention? The model is, of course, not exact. It's not a detail by detail account of attention. It does not depict neurons and competitive interactions and other physical underpinnings. The brain does not need to know that level of detail. Instead, the model depicts attention as something ethereal, a mental possession, an essence inside you that makes certain things vivid, that empowers you to know and to act. The model, in effect, tells you that you have a conscious experience, and it does so because that is a useful, quick and dirty description of what attention is. When the information from these two models, the Apple model and the attention model, when those two models are blended together, the, uh, and when that information reaches higher cognition, then it provides a sufficient basis for the system to think there is an apple, it's green, it's round, and I have a subjective experience of it. You need both types of information to form that belief and to make that claim. Let's go back to this summary slide and let's talk philosophy for a moment. Some people would call this an illusionist theory as opposed to a realist theory. A realist theory says there is a real phenomenon of consciousness, a real phenomenon that underlies the beliefs and claims that people make about having conscious experience. And scientists can try to explain how the phenomenon emerges. An illusionist theory says, no, there is no real phenomenon of consciousness. It's an illusion. It does not exist. We just think we have it and claim we have it, but there's no underlying real thing. And to me, that framing is not that useful. It's a distortion that is meant to polarize people into camps. Be because what is this theory? Well, it's a realist theory. It posits a real phenomenon, attention, that underlies the beliefs and claims that people make about having consciousness. But on the other hand, the thing we say we have and believe we have, the magic essence of conscious experience that envelops some of our perceptions and thoughts, that thing indeed is different from the actual physical phenomenon of attention, All right? The information has become simplified and distorted along this pathway. So it's kind of an illusion. Or look, to go back to the original analogy I gave you, my body schema tells me that I have an arm. That's not an illusion because I do actually have an arm. But my body schema gives me a simplified, imperfect representation of my arm. The model does not tell me about the little mechanical internal details of my arm. 
And sometimes the model gets it wrong. The body schema says my arm is here when it's really there. So in a sense, maybe it is a little bit of an illusion. The brain builds models. The models are never perfect. Therefore, any particular model can be both realist and a little illusionist at the same time. That's not a profound mystery. That's literally every model the brain constructs. So you can have a kind of philosophical meltdown over that, uh, but I just don't think that concern is very interesting. Consciousness is understandable in a pragmatic engineering sense without worrying too much about the philosophical labels. So is AST correct? Does the brain actually construct a model of attention, an attention schema, and use it for these purposes? Evidence for AST so far comes from many different directions. Here I'll give only a, a brief summary of some of the evidence, uh, because again, I want to get across the underlying concepts and not the experimental details. Uh, you can read about those on your own. Let's start with the neuroscience evidence about uh, cortical networks. In principle, AST could be realized on any computational hardware. It's not necessarily tied to any specific brain area, but we can still ask whether the human brain contains an area or a set of areas whose activity patterns are consistent with building an attention schema. A, a structure like that should combine the following properties. It should be involved in building predictive models of your own attention, in controlling your own attention, in attributing conscious mind states to other people, and in reports of conscious experience. And it turns out the temporoparietal junction, or TPJ, may satisfy these conditions. The, the TPJ is active in association with attention. Uh, many of the results from the TPJ are consistent with predictive modeling of attention in predicting where your attention is likely to go next. One of the classical, most robust findings uh, and we've seen the same, is that the TPJ lights up when the prediction is wrong, when attention is pulled somewhere non-predicted. So something in there is making predictions about attention and comparing predictions to reality and then revving up when the prediction is wrong, perhaps because it's updating its predictive model. An overlapping subregion of the TPJ is also classically active in theory of mind, attributing a mind to other people. In our own work, it, it lights up nicely when people judge the attention or the consciousness of someone else. Theory of mind is really asking yourself the question, what is in the range of that other person's attention right now? What is in that person's consciousness right now? Now, the TPJ also lights up when you report that you yourself are conscious of a visual stimulus. That's another set of studies that, that we did. And finally, damage to the TPJ is classically associated with hemispatial neglect, a clinical syndrome in which the patient loses attentional control toward and also subjective consciousness of anything on the opposite side of space. It's, it's, it's arguably 
the most devastating specific deficit of consciousness in the clinical literature. All of these properties are emphasized in the right TPJ, uh, but to some extent can also be found in the left. These overlapping findings are consistent with the TPJ playing a role in constructing a predictive attention schema, which is then involved in the control of attention, in attributing attentive mind states to others, and in a person's claims about his or her own subjective uh, consciousness. The, the TPJ is just one node in a larger network, uh, and it's unlikely to operate alone. It probably has many functions beyond the ones noted here. Uh, but I think a fair amount of evidence points to the TPJ as at least helping to construct a model of attention. That model can be applied to oneself or to other people. Now let's talk about another area of research, the uh, relationship between attention and consciousness. <clears throat> In AST, you claim to be conscious of something uh, based on cognitive access to the attention schema. The attention schema in turn is a representation of your state of attention. Experimentally, this means that consciousness and attention should almost always co-vary. What you attend to, you should normally be conscious of. What you don't attend to, you should normally not be conscious of. And this is experimentally true almost all the time. Some theorists even propose that consciousness is attention uh, because the two co-vary so tightly. In AST, the two are not exactly the same. Consciousness is essentially the picture the brain paints to represent attention. And that little bit of daylight between consciousness and attention is important. It comes about because the brain's models are never perfect. They make mistakes. For example, the arm model, uh, part of the body schema, tracks the arm most of the time, but makes occasional mistakes. Just so here, we should expect the attention schema to make the occasional mistake. Maybe at one particular moment, you're attending to the apple, but the attention schema glitches and fails to represent that state of attention. And in that case, you're attending to something without reportable consciousness of it. And that phenomenon is now well established in probably about a hundred studies by now, some of which we've done. Attention and consciousness almost always match, but with dim or brief stimuli, it's possible to measurably draw a person's attention to an object while the person has no conscious perception of that object. Or to put this differently, attention is a thing you objectively have, measurable from the outside by other people. Consciousness is a thing you believe you have and say you have, and is observable by other people only through your report. Moreover, consciousness almost always co-varies with attention. Where attention goes, consciousness goes. One has to work relatively hard in the laboratory to trick the system and get consciousness to slip and dissociate from attention. Those essential facts by themselves should tell you, I think they're hitting you over the head with the obvious, consciousness is a model or a representation of attention. Here's another very specific prediction. 
and apologies for the slightly complicated logic. According to AST, if you're attending to the apple, but the attention schema has glitched, like in the slide here, so you're not conscious of the apple. <clears throat> That should also mean that you lose the ability to control that focus of attention on the apple. In AST, attention is possible without consciousness, but a good endogenous control of attention should be impossible without consciousness. And many experiments, including some from my own lab, show exactly that pattern. I'll very briefly summarize one particularly elegant example, not from my lab, uh, but from Tsushima et al. 2006. When performing a task centered at location A, which requires a lot of attention, it is uh, advantageous to reduce attention on a distractor at location B. Uh, people are usually good at that kind of nuanced control. Uh, however, when people are not conscious of the distractor, they lose control over their attention on it, and more of their attention is siphoned over to it. So think about that. When you're conscious of a distractor, you pay less attention to it, as you should. When you're not conscious of the distractor, you lose control and pay more attention to it, pulling attention away from your primary task. That is control theory in action. You need a functioning control model to monitor and control attention. These kinds of complexities are neatly explained by this theory and really not by any other theory that I know. AST is at its heart about the specific relationship between attention and consciousness. And uh, other theories, as far as I know, do not make these specific predictions about that relationship. AST is about how consciousness plays a crucial role in controlling attention the attention schema is the control model that allows you to control your attention, which allows you to carry out complex and flexible behavior. So in this theory, consciousness is not just some fluffy add-on. It's really central to all complex attentive behavior. Now, let's talk about social cognition. What is the evidence for this branch of the theory? We've talked about the other two branches. It's well established that people reconstruct the attention of others. And in that sense, we already know this part of the theory is correct. People build models of other people's attention. However, most work on uh, social attention focuses on one simplistic part, how you reconstruct the gaze direction of others. And, and it turns out that we do way more than that. We build rather sophisticated predictive models of other people's attention, not just what's in John's attention, but how it got there, how it might slip out of his attention what he might attend to next, and how his attention will affect his behavior. So we seem to build a very rich, very complex model of other people's attention. Uh, uh, one of the weirdest and most interesting example of a social model of attention um, comes from a series of experiments that we did in my own lab. If you think that a face is attending to an object. It turns out that you build a subthreshold visual model of attention. Visual motion areas in your brain become active in a pattern consistent with a stream flowing from the face to the object of its attention. 
And not only does this motion signal appear in brain scans, it also creates a measurable motion after effect. So you can measure that motion after effect with uh, psychophysical studies. And if you're asked to judge whether a tilted object is likely to fall over, your decision is unconsciously affected by the presence of a face staring at the object, as though the attentive gaze of that face is streaming toward and gently pushing on the object. Michael? Yes. Is it okay? So we have until um, 20 more minutes. And when will you be ready to take questions? Very soon. Okay, good. Maybe five more five more minutes, if that's okay. 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 Excellent. All right. So even more telling, if I show you a face and an object, and I embed in the image an actual faint subthreshold visual motion signal flowing from the face to the object. It's so faint you don't explicitly notice it, but it's there. It turns out you will perceive that face as more attentive to the object. It, it, it appears that we humans automatically represent attention, at least partly, as something flowing from the attentive person to the object of attention. It, it, it's like drawing arrows on the social world. Uh, I think the motion signal probably helps people to swiftly and intuitively keep track of who is attending to what. Uh, and it happens under the surface. Uh, I think the visual motion signal is kept to a, a low level, a sub-threshold level, because if it got any stronger, it would interfere with real vision. The signal evolved to be just strong enough to nudge social cognition and help it out, but not strong enough to harm real vision. So I, I don't want to harp too much on the weird phenomenon of eye beams, uh, because I think it's just one little part of how we build a simplified and cartoonish model of attention. But it's a cool little detail. And it may be that this cool little detail built into the social cognitive machinery has had some influence on the common cultural beliefs about uh, mind and soul, including folk beliefs about consciousness as a subtle, invisible energy-like essence that can shine out of us, an aura or a chi or a ghost. Uh, some of these cultural ideas may be uh, embedded in or may have derived from uh, these deep, simplified models of attention that we all construct, that we ought automatically construct. So, in the overarching theory, this is now a summary, an attention schema is crucial for controlling one's own attention, without which you would be unable to do almost any complex sequence of actions. And an attention schema is crucial for attributing an attentive mind to other people, attributing consciousness to others. Without it, you would have very poor theory of mind. And an attention schema, because it's a schematic model, not an accurate model, may give rise to common beliefs surrounding consciousness. We think we have a private, intangible essence that gives us a vivid mental possession of items. We think it because we have a bundle of information, an attention schema that provides a simplified, cartoonish description of our own attention. This is the attention schema theory. This is why my work over the past 12 years has become so obsessed with an attention schema, uh, because I see it as a kind of linchpin to a lot of human cognition. From the point of view of artificial intelligence, uh, consciousness is now ripe
for investigation. This framework gives us the mechanistic outlines of what consciousness is. Uh, we have an idea, at least roughly, of how to go about building it. And we have some insight into the value that it adds or why it would improve the performance of an artificial agent and make the agent better able to interface with people. And, and this is why I think the study of consciousness is no longer primarily about philosophy or psychology or neuroscience. From now on, consciousness is primarily about technology. And that's now a main focus of my lab, building this into artificial systems. Uh, and I'll end with a claim that I often make and that I think is true. The watershed moment in the, the history of our species that will change us forever, uh, maybe for good, maybe for bad, I think for good, is the inevitable moment that we understand consciousness well enough to build it. Thank you all. I will stop there.